Welcome to the People's School for Marxist and Leninist Studies. Our topic that we're going to focus on tonight is we're going to study the fundamentals of Marxism Leninism. This was created by a group of Soviet authors headed by Otto Willy Gusinin. We're going to focus especially on Chapter 13, the Marxist Leninist Party and its role in the workers' class struggle. Strong, disciplined Communist Party is an essential component of any working class movement that is striving to successfully build socialism. This class is going to help clarify the importance of the party of a new type as an integral part of Marxist Leninist theory and practice. With that, I am going to turn it over to our readers so we can go ahead and begin the study. So, this is chapter 13 The Marxist Leninist Party and its role in the workers' class struggle. This was written in 1961. The enemies of communism allege that the creation of Marxist parties is the work of a few agitators. If this were true, the communists would long since have been wiped out because they have been persecuted for many decades. For example, Italian fascism dealt the communist party brutal blows. On the eve of World War II, it numbered no more than 15,000 members, that being the Communist Party of Italy, the CPI. But in the long run, fascism was smashed. The Communist Party quickly grew into a mass party and now numbers nearly 2 million members. So that was maybe a decade or so after the war that this was written. In many countries, the reactionary capitalist class subjected the communists to all kinds of repression, imprisoning, and brutally murdering their best leaders. But nowhere did it succeed in destroying the revolutionary parties of the working class. Persecution is of no avail against the Marxist parties. This shows that the Communist parties have been called into existence by the profound objective needs of social development and primarily by the interests and needs of the working class. Section one of this chapter says, what party does the working class need? Question mark. In scientifically substantiating the historic role of the working class, Marx and Engels at the same time established that the proletariat needed an independent political party for the revolutionary transformation of a capitalist society into socialist society. They not only wrote about this, beginning with the Communist Manifesto, but they also did a great deal to organize such a party. In 1847, Marx and Engels created the first communist organization, the Communist League. The Communist League can be considered the prototype of the modern Communist Party. So this was how Marx and Engels were involved in. On the basis of its experience, as also on that of the International Working Men's Association, which was the first international, which was founded in 1864, and is known in the history of the working class movement as the first international, Marx and Engels drew many important conclusions on the role of the revolutionary party of the working class, its organization and policies. So this isn't even Lenin yet, this is still Marx and Engels. Under new historical conditions, that being the conditions of imperialism, Vladimir Lenin developed these conclusions of Marx and Engels into a harmonious teaching on the party. Lenin showed the leading role of the party in the working class movement. Lenin formulated its organizational principles and norms of internal life and the fundamental principles of its policies and tactics. This teaching is one of Lenin's most important contributions of Marxism, that being the party. So part of why we're reading this tonight, some people try to detach that component from Lenin and they will praise Lenin in a way that detaches it from the party. And we are reading here that Lenin said it was an instrumental and essential component of Marxism. I had quoted this book, The Fundamentals of Marxism-Leninism, in one of these articles that I wrote about patriotism, because part of that comes up. And I just wanted some clarity because I had been told that this book was specifically written to talk about the conditions in the Soviet Union and not as Marxist Leninist theory, which could be applied to the international. If we're talking about Marxism Leninism as a science, and if we understand it as a science, then a book on the fundamentals of Marxism Leninism, if we're understanding it in that way, we should come to conclusions from reading this that are applicable universally. A good question of the People's School in previous iterations, and I heard a great comment one time. It was, 
the scientific method does not change on a per country basis from Angola to Cuba to Canada to wherever. Chemical reactions still happen a certain way. Newtonian laws still operate the same way. So if we're analyzing it scientifically, the fundamentals of Marxism and Leninism should be applicable on a universal scale. Right in the first paragraph, it talks about the Italian party becoming a mass party. And that's not my understanding of a communist party. Others can contribute to that, whether it was right or wrong. My understanding is a communist party is a vanguard party and different than a mass party. My understanding is that you're correct. In our Eight Points of Unity, we talk about a vanguard cadre party, the distinction between a mass party and a cadre party. The comrade from Vermont, the member of the party, who's also a member of the Greek party, has talked about this, how the Greek party still operates in a way where they have the cadre system that we do. Candidates have to apply for cadre ship. People have to apply for candidacy. It's very rigorous, much more rigorous on a scale compared to maybe what some of the other parties are operating with in terms of how many people they have in their parties and organizations. Parties like the Japanese party today would be considered a mass party. They're not a cadre party. As opposed to parties like us today, we would be considered a cadre party and not a mass party. So my understanding is that there's definitely distinct components to either of them. But in some sense, I've heard that they can be joined together almost. In one of the videos on the PSMLS YouTube, I see History of the American Communist Movement. There is one of the videos where it talks about how this organization, SDS, which stood for Students for a Democratic Society, it was a mass organization that was based in the universities. And in that class, there's one point where something comes up where there were segments of SDS that wanted to transition into sort of a vanguard cadre party structure. And they wanted to transition this mass party organization into something that was closer to a Marxist-Leninist party. Clearly, that didn't work. Where did that go? It's not here today. So I just wanted to point that out, that there is a relevant section on the American Communist Party history videos on the PSMLS YouTube. We often talk about Lenin, we talk about state revolution, we talk about all these different works, stuff in communism and infantile disorder, imperialism, obviously. But few people, in my estimation, focus enough on the party as one of Lenin's contributions to Marxism as a revolutionary science. They will call themselves Leninists or even Marxist Leninists, and they'll just be individuals with online accounts. They'll have ML in their Twitter bio or in however way that they identify themselves in an online setting. But being a follower of Lenin is being a part of a Bolshevik party. That's not stress enough. First off, I wanted to second what Karmat had said, because I am of the belief that a communist not in the party is an academic, not a communist. If you have a bunch of people talking about communist theory and they're not in a party, they're not communist, it's a book club. That being said, the thing that I wanted to focus on was the part where it talks about the oppression of communist parties under the bourgeoisie and the inevitable overcoming of that oppression. Because here in America, I'm sure that everybody knows we have faced some severe repression in history. There have been countless acts of violence and acts of sabotage taken against communists in history. The first people who were executed under the 1917 Espionage Act were communists. The Rosenberg, it was the Rosenberg case. That won't beat us. We will overcome because socialism is a historic necessity of development. So just don't get discouraged by the amount of repression that we have and continue to face because we will overcome. I wonder, second also what Kamen said about being in a party. That's probably one of the most important things anyone who describes themselves as a communist or even a socialist needs to do. And it really does continue to aggravate me when I hear and see online leftists on Twitter and whatnot who constantly tweet out a bunch of great stuff but then are hesitant, for whatever reason, to join a party. At this point, the situation I feel is just so tense, is so dire, that obviously I would like them to join this party, but at least be in a party. Be active in some collective group. 
a one man Marxist Leninist on Twitter, as described, is just an academic. It's frankly a waste of energy and a waste of time if you're not in a collective and in a party learning discipline and learning how Bolshevik Party operates. I know a comrade that was with me during the CPUSA when I was younger. As communists, the party should be like your family. And this comrade had such a bad experience, he refuses to get with the party. No matter how good I tell him it is, he doesn't want to be with the party. And I'm like, we're collective, so I don't get how that makes any sense. So I think some people are thinking it's all going to be CPUSA or something. We need to convince them otherwise. To kind of touch on what the comrade's point was just making is how do we get these quote unquote academics to actually join the fight? I don't think it's worth the effort. A communist party is built from the working class. We shouldn't spend our time trying to convince a bunch of petty bourgeois intellectuals on Twitter to join our party. Our focus should be on building strength within the working class. In Foundations of Leninism, Stalin talks a great deal about this, where as the increasing proletarianization happens naturally under capitalism of academics, of the petty bourgeois, of people who we wouldn't necessarily normally consider revolutionary, these people join the party. And when the time comes, these are the people who will waver. These are the people who won't be disciplined. And these are people that you can't count on. And these are the people that are the most dangerous to the party and to the movement. The trepidation that almost happens. I'm a new-ish communist, one, one and a half years. And joining a party is actually something that didn't really come to the forefront of my mind until about six months ago. And I think a lot of that has to do with the individualistic nature of American society specifically as a barrier to overcome, where people either feel disillusioned to the point where they feel like there's no real benefit to joining a party, but also we're propagandized into thinking that the individual is the most important piece of a society and that collectivism isn't really in our upbringing and such, at least from my experience. So I think that was something that I had to shake before I could actually take the steps necessary to join a party. Also, there's so much fragmentation in the American party scene, you would call it, I guess. It's just difficult to gravitate to something that's ideologically concrete and productive. About the role of people who are convinced of Marxist-Leninism but aren't in a party. I think that while a lot of the things that our other comrades have said are true, that a lot of these people will not be worth winning over to our cause long term, I think that we in the party have a reciprocal role our job is to gain the trust of people who are hesitant, show them that there's a million and one parties claiming to be communist, claiming to be vanguard this or that or the other thing. Our job is to prove to people outside the party that we're the real deal, that we're going to make the revolution in this country. That's part of our job as people already in the party. When Marx was in England and he was organizing the Communist Party, and the First International. Many of us know that Marx's opinion on it was that the old philosophers had simply interpreted the world as it is, but the point is to change it. And that what they were doing was basically just talking about what was, but they were never applying into practical reality what they wanted it to be and what it could be. And that was the point of contention between Marx and Engels with the other idealist philosophers and elements that were within the labor movement at the time. The biggest problem I've seen in building the Communist Party in this country is individualism. That to me is the biggest problem. People feel nobody's going to tell them what to do. I've seen it in our own party. I've seen it in other parties. This idea that the cell or the local group is what's important, but all the local groups together in the country are not important. That's not because they, again, individually only used to connect to the guy next door to them. And so I find it a real problem. Nothing is hard in my life than to try to build a party. The hardest thing for a communist is to be in a group collective. Why? They lack discipline. They don't relate to discipline. They don't relate to democratic centralism, which means if a higher body comes out to a decision, 
they'll say, well, I wasn't part of that decision. Well, you're not supposed to be. You're in a lower body. And this idea that one center is not enough. We need many centers, sort of like poly Marxism, many types of Marxism. We're general staff. We're an army. Lenin calls an army. We have to act like an army. Let's stop acting like children. We have to have discipline and take the lead from the elected leaders of the party. I'm going to turn it back over to our readers to continue the class. Revolutionary character of a Marxist party. Of all the organizations created by the working class, only a political party can give proper expression to the basic interests of the working class and lead it to complete victory. With the aid of trade unions, mutual aid societies, and other similar organizations alone, the workers will never be able to put an end to capitalism and build a socialist society. For this, the workers need an organization of a higher type, an organization that does not confine itself to the struggle for the satisfaction of the current needs of the working people, but aims at bringing the working class to power in order to effect a revolutionary transformation of society. Such an organization is the Communist Party. Vladimir Lenin wrote that, in order that the bulk of a certain class may learn to understand its interests and its position, in order that it may learn to pursue its own policies, requires precisely that the advanced elements of this class should be organized immediately and at all costs even if these elements at first constitute a negligible part of the class. As long as the working class wages only an economic struggle, the bourgeoisie does not see any great danger in that for itself. But when the working class organizes politically, i.e. creates a political party which expresses its will as a class, the bourgeoisie begins seriously to fear for its rule. That is why reaction deals its main blows against the political party of the working class. At the same time, trying to undermine the party from within, capitalist propaganda endeavors to persuade the workers that they can do without their own party. One of the manifestations of bourgeois influence on the working class is the anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist denial of the leading role of a political party. Anarchists entirely reject the necessity for any political organization. The anarcho-syndicalists preach that the working class should not engage in politics and that trade unions alone are enough. By denying politics, the anarchists, in actual fact, subordinate the working class to bourgeois politics, exposing the theoretical untenability and the danger of these views. Comrade Lenin wrote, Only a political party of the working class, a communist party, is capable of uniting, educating, and organizing such a vanguard of the proletariat and the whole masses of the working people. A vanguard which is alone able to resist the inevitable petty bourgeois vacillations of this mass, the inevitable tradition and relapse of trade unionist narrowness or trade unionist prejudices amidst the proletariat, and to lead all of the joint activity of the whole proletariat to lead the proletariat politically and through it to lead all of the masses of the working people. However, not every political party claiming the leadership of the working class is capable of accomplishing this task. This is evident from the experience of the social democratic parties of the Second International. Acting through the opportunist leaders of social democracy, the bourgeoisie was able to a considerable extent to bring these parties under its influence, to quote-unquote tame them and make them barely distinguishable from the usual bourgeois parliamentary opposition. As a result, the Social Democratic Party, which at first raised high hopes in the working class, lost their ability to organize and lead the revolutionary working class movement. This was particularly evident when all of the social contradictions engendered by the epoch of imperialism became extremely aggravated. Objective reality and the interests of the proletariat made the creation of working class parties of a new type a matter of imperative necessity. 
the first such party was successfully built in Russia, where the imperialist contradictions were particularly sharp. At the end of the 1890s, Comrade Lenin raised the banner of struggle against opportunism in the ranks of social democracy. This struggle set an example for the revolutionary movement throughout the world. After the Great October Socialist Revolution, communist parties began to be organized in many countries. The national peculiarities and the conditions of the struggle have left their imprint on each communist party, but at the same time, they all have something in common that radically distinguishes them from the Social Democratic Party. The main thing that characterizes the parties of a new type is their irreconcilability to capitalism. The communists are waging an active struggle for its abolition, for a revolutionary transformation of a capitalist society, for they hold that political power by the working class and the establishment of a dictatorship of the proletariat are essential conditions for this transformation. Hence, the intolerance displayed by communists for all forms of opportunism, which in practice signifies adaptation to capitalism. The communist parties do not act blindly, groping in the dark, but are guided by the revolutionary theory of Marxism-Leninism, which scientifically expresses the fundamental interests of the working class. The party is a voluntary union of like-minded persons united for the purpose of applying the Marxist world outlook and carrying out the historic mission of the working class. The revolutionary character of the party determines its organizational principles, its unity, its identity of action and the flexibility of its tactics. But the communist parties owe their strength mainly to the fact that they are not parties of isolated individuals or narrow groups of professional revolutionaries, but of the broad masses of the working people with whom they establish the closest possible contact and whose struggle they strive to lead. Where they were talking about trade unionism, the anarcho-syndicalists preach that the working class should not engage in politics, that trade unions alone are enough. And a lot of times I do see a lot of people that are communists, they will support the IWW and things like that. But if people don't know, the IWW did in 1946, took a stance against the communists and the Marxist Leninist parties. They called them a major menace of the working class and called the totalitarian regime in Russia. First off, I wanted to second what the previous comrade had said about the unionists. As another example, look in Burkina Faso. There were some examples of some reactionary unions trying to undermine the socialist government there as well. Also, the part where it was talking about the social democrats remind you of any parties nowadays, DSA, Bernie Sanders. It was something that I think it's crazy how word for word you'd replace social democrats with the DSA and it could be just as applicable. This emphasis on trade unionism and trade unionists. Gus Hall used to say, in our party, we have many good trade unionists, but not too many good communists. And I understand now what he was talking about because there are a lot of people who are active in their unions, and that's a good thing. But the communist plus, which is the other half of the equation, is left out. And so people are doing good trade union work but they're ignoring their communist work. About the Italian Communist Party, the PTI, PTE. <laughs> I was in Italy a lot in the 70s, okay? And I can say it was a mass party, 100%. They say like two million people, members is possible, but for sure a million and a half. The French one had a million. And it didn't hurt to be a mass party. They could pull one million people in the streets in protest. I've seen it in Paris. I know in Rome, Bologna and Firenze and other places they did too. It was very relevant. As far as cadres, they were all cadres. Like in France, you know, you join, you join. That's it. There was no uh, candidacy or anything like that. But we were all on the same page because the culture, the history, the traditions of communism for hundreds of years, you know, there was no a little infighting and all that BS. 
So it was mass parties and they meant a lot and they could have gotten power back in the 70s. Remember in Italy, they were close to it in the mid 70s, early 70s, super close to take power in Italy. It was a big thing. The NATO was so scared. The US, they had bases there. It was so scared of the Italian Communist Party. Early in this part of the reading, it mentioned the party's purpose is not to focus on the demands of today, but to focus on seizing power to put the control in the hands of the people. And I think that that's something that needs to be remembered and iterated to the people a lot, because in looking at current communist parties around the world, especially like, for instance, in India, the way they're weakening them is by giving concessions to the people. They say, oh, you guys want food, and that's why you're a communist. Well, we'll give you some food. And then they lower the numbers of the communists there to try to weaken their strength of support base. So that's something that we need to remember and hold steadfast to, is that it's not just about today, but about taking power for the future and to change the whole system. And I think that's something that the message needs to get to the people about. With these academic types, if you build it, they'll come. So they have the knowledge, they just don't see the value in the party. If we show them the value in the party, those people will come eventually. So we don't need to focus too much energy on persuading them. The second thing is with anti-authoritarian and individualism in America, part of it is because of how bourgeois oppression has been so gross and so permeating in our lives that most people just attribute that oppression, that bourgeois oppression, with authoritarianism. So we have to, again, teach that any kind of socialist authoritarianism would be for the good of all. Final thing is an example of how, as anarchists screwing up everything, I don't know if anybody heard but recently with the subreddit anti-work, there were several mods that put a vote up to see whether or not people wanted them to interview on Fox. And everybody voted no, but they went ahead and did it anyway. And the mod who did it was an anarchist. And it gave the whole subreddit a horrible look. They've had to go private now. It's a huge setback for the labor movement as far as online. I think when it comes to bourgeois individualism, the different sectors of society will respond to it differently. And my question is for senior politicians and revolutionaries like Angelo. I would like to find out how rampant is bourgeois individualism among the working class, especially the industrial proletariat, because that is expected to be the vanguard in terms of manpower. As a member for 32 years of the trade union movement in New York City, society is infected with individualism, even in the trade union movement. That's right, even in the trade union movement. As long as we have this, in the working class movement, whether it's in the trade union movement or in the communist or the socialist movement. As long as we have that, we're not going to go anywhere. Individuals who insist that they just became Marxists last week, and now they're going to go into a Marxist party, and they're going to tell them how to run the party when they just became Marxists last week is absurd. It's the epitome of individualism. Think about that. We have to give credit where credit is due. And people that have been suffering under capitalism and building a movement, whether in the trade union movement or the communist movement, these people have to be given some kind of credit. They proved to last the struggle. Someone who comes in last week, you think they're going to be here five weeks from now, let alone two years? I doubt it. I doubt it. If they're willing to learn, they'll replace the old timers. If they refuse to learn, they'll do what Lenin said, the trash heap of history. With respect to the Reddit thing, we are never going to get any success out of Reddit or social media. We will at most get our word out, but any movement that can be decimated by a single Fox News interview is not a movement. That's right. <laughs> it's not a movement. This reading talks a lot about the flaws of social democracy and these movements. And not a lot of people know this, but nearing the end of World War I, there was an uprising in Germany called the Keeler Uprising. And the communists nearly achieved a successful revolution in Germany. 
And when the critical moment came, the social democrats sided with the liberals and the fascists. Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, the leaders of the movement, were killed by proto-fascists. And there is a saying in Germany to this day that roughly translates to who betrayed us, the social democrats did. On the individualism we've been talking about tonight, there was a quote, I can't remember who it's attributed to, but it's, there's no such thing as poor people in America. There's only inconvenienced billionaires. And with our current society, that mentality has infiltrated a lot of people's mindsets where they don't have the class consciousness to identify as a member of the working class and realize that they completely outnumber all of the bourgeois influencers that are just seeking to divide them further and further into these factions and weaken their movement as a whole. So like everyone's been saying previously, I don't think we're going to get anywhere in the U.S. specifically until we get rid of that whole, oh, well, I'm just waiting for my lucky moment to become one of the billionaires and then I get to call the shots where we could call the shots because we already outnumber the billionaires. In the reading that I mentioned, the social democratic parties and how easily they were tamed by the bourgeoisie. You can see similar stuff here in the U.S. with parties like the Working Families Party, who was originally started by the trade unions and has been nothing but lapdogs for the Democrats. Social media is useful for exactly two things, propaganda and fundraising. Social media debate is performative and pointless. And other than that, it's really just useful for platforming, party messaging, and fundraising in certain circumstances. In terms of the necessity of establishing a dictatorship of the proletariat and following a vanguard party, in my experience, that is one of the primary obstacles that I've faced when convincing people of joining a communist party or even getting behind the things that I initiate. And I may be wrong on this, but I don't believe that any propaganda or brochures exist that details the necessity of a dictatorship of the proletariat and a vanguard party. And so I was wondering if I was wrong on that and something like that exists. Why Communism by Moshe Olgan. I found that the first chapter, actually the first two or three paragraphs, says it great. It starts like this. You have a lousy job. The boss is a real piece of crap. You come in the next day and it's horrible working conditions. You can't pay your rent. You're being thrown out by the landlord. Does that sound familiar to everybody here? I think that particular writing is anybody today could hear that and understand what they're saying. Then it goes on to say, you produce everything. With your hands and your mind, you produce everything. And yet, you don't own anything. You don't even have a place to sit at the table. There's something wrong with this picture. That's the way that book goes into it, that first chapter. And I think if you put that in a pamphlet, that's all you have to say. Stop acting as an individual. Join others who are disgusted with what's going on and join a party for workers. The principles of the organizational structure of a communist party follow from the role it is destined to play in the working class movement and the nature of its aims and tasks. The interests expressed by a communist party are not the mere sum total of the private interests of individual workers or groups of workers. They are the interests of a whole class and can manifest themselves only through the common will which unites numerous isolated action into one common struggle. Only a centralized leadership is capable of uniting all the forces, directing them towards a single goal, and imparting unity to the uncoordinated actions of individual workers and groups of workers. Absolute centralization and the strictest discipline of the proletariat constitute one of the fundamental conditions 
for victory over the bourgeoisie. But the common will of the party cannot be created otherwise than democratically, i.e. jointly, collectively, by comparing the different opinions and proposals and then adopting decisions binding for all. The common will thus elaborated has the advantage that it gives the fullest and therefore truest expression to the objective needs of the class struggle of the proletariat. Thus, the centralism of a communist party is a democratic centralism. It is based on the will of the broadest membership of the party. In practice, democratic centralism means all the leading party bodies from top to bottom are elected. Regular accounts are rendered by party bodies to their party organization. Strict party discipline and subordination of the minority to the majority. Decisions of the higher bodies are absolutely obligatory on all of the lower bodies. In every communist party, the principle of democratic centralism underlies the rules that determine the structure and forms of its organization, the norms of its internal life, the method of the practical activities of the party organization, and the duties and rights of the party members. The duties of a party member constitute the cornerstone of all party activity. Since the Communist Party is called upon to carry out the greatest task of radically reorganizing society, it cannot consider a mere agreement of its members with the party program sufficient. A communist is one who actively helps to carry out the program of the party and necessarily works in one of its organizations under its leadership and control. The opportunists do not make such demands of the members of their party. It was on this question that a split occurred in 1903 between the revolutionary and opportunistic trends in the Russian Social Democratic Party. Today, all communist parties guide themselves by the Leninist principle of membership. At the same time, the concrete conditions for admissions and the duties required by a particular communist party from its members take into account the peculiarities of the country and the traditions of its working class movement. The parties admit new members readily, but at the same time, circumspectly, and careful not to contaminate the party ranks with agent provocateurs sent in by the bourgeoisie or with casual elements. Some communist parties, for example, the French and Italian, annually exchange or re-register their members' party cards. The exchange of cards aims at bringing the membership into activity and strengthening work among the masses, enables the party, when the conditions are right for it, to get rid of those who have actually ceased to function in their party organization. It's talking about the idea of casual members, or the idea that being in a party it is a requirement that you engage in the duties. At the same time, the concrete conditions for admission and the duties required by a particular communist party from its members, that's talking about when you join a party, it is not a club. It's not a group of people who have the same ideology as you, who it's fun to be around those people, so you join. You are actually pledging a responsibility and duty not just to the party, but to the working class, because we just read that the working class, the Vanguard Party, is an extension of the interests of the entire working class. I want to highlight and stress party membership and party activity being contingent upon consistent party activity. The section on democratic centralism, where it said the minority is to be subordinate to the majority, that brought me back to all the times I've spoken with anarchists where they'd always say decisions had to be made unanimously. So even if the greater majority would vote for something, if a small minority decided they didn't want to do it, the decision would be that they don't do it, which is contradictory because doesn't that mean the minority is now in charge of the majority is a big contradiction.
If you join a party and leave when concessions are made, then you're not a communist. And also, this is a party. You need to do work. We need to help the party further its goals. This isn't a club. We're all here to do something. We have a purpose, and we can all help the party in our own way. All of this is bringing to mind a piece that I read a couple of days ago about what they call Pac-Man Revolution, which I'm sure that most people here have played Pac-Man, but for anyone who hasn't and isn't familiar with it, Pac-Man runs around this maze gobbling up little stuff. And so the whole idea of Pac-Man Revolution is people who attempt to instigate revolution through, they think that a strike is a revolution, starting a commune or a workers' cooperative is the start of a revolution. And it's trying to achieve it by chasing these piecemeal gangs. We do not want local power. We do not want temporary concession. We want the overthrow of the national bourgeoisie and international capitalism. We cannot settle for concessions. We don't want crumbs. We don't want a loaf of bread. We want the bakery because we run the bakery. We're the ones who make the bread. A real example of why it can be so frustrating sometimes with unions. We recently in our union, we had a vote regarding some safety regulations for COVID. And in it, we could not come to a unanimous agreement, unfortunately. And the vote was about whether or not we wanted to protest the return to school policies and the health policies. And because a small minority of teachers had no issues with going back to work, nothing happened and the majority fell apart. So which is why democratic centralism is so critical and important, and which is why it's so important in our party to have that discipline. As our party has come into existence, Bolsheviks are back. They walk this land once again. We always read about Mensheviks, and it was always to me this historical thing. And so what is a Menshevik? Menshevik, I believe, means those who go with the minority. We have met and dealt with Mensheviks who go with the minority, whereas we, the Bolsheviks, go with the majority. Right now, the CPUSA is our enemy. But as we grow, the DSA is our enemy. The CPUSA and the DSA are actually merging, more like the CPUSA works within the DSA. That's where they're going for organizing. That is who our enemy will be. How... When you join a communist party, you do make that pledge, you make that promise to carry out the interests of the working class. And it's no small feat what we're trying to do. We're trying to build socialism in the heart of the empire, in the heart of imperialism. And it's a lot. And that's why we are trying to be the vanguard party, trying to be this party to lead the working class as a cadre party. And we all do our little parts with the amount of people that we have. We can move mountains, we can do big things. And I had my own little wake-up call with Comrade Angelo, and we were talking about how when you're part of a party, you take this duty. Like you said, it's not a hangout club. It's not to lollygally. It's to promise and do your part, do an active part to try to build socialism. Get off your arse if you really say that you're about this, then be about it. The opportunists do not make such demands of the members of their parties, those demands being party activity and party engagement constituting a cornerstone of party membership. Branching off of what I was saying earlier, you have people online in their Twitter bios, call themselves ML, Marxist, Leninists, whatever way they identify online, they'll do that. And then you have another group of people, and Angelo can speak to this, who will join a party, but then not participate in any activity in the party. They'll apply for membership, they'll get a card, they'll almost use the party as an identity that they adhere to, but not in terms of participating in practical work, attending meetings consistently, offering to help, being proactive and offering to give assistance to people. And so we have to remind ourselves that this is not a new trend. Lenin figured this out in 1903, over 100 years ago. You can't have a party if you have a bunch of do-nothings. Not to be disrespectful, but to be serious about the issues that we're talking about. Because you know who's not doing nothing? The capitalists. Capitalists are looking every single day to make sure that the work that we're doing does not succeed. And so we have a working class party that has workers in it that don't do party work. People should analyze that and take party work very seriously. This idea of democratic centralism 
is basic to a Bolshevik party. I found that people don't know what it means. Here's what I found. To them, democratic centralism means three people sitting in a group practice democratic centralism. They discuss something, they vote on it, and then that's the rule of the land. That's not democratic centralism. Think about that. That's parochialism. That's what it is. Democratic centralism starts from the top. That has to be understood. After discussion, they come to a decision. That becomes the decision of the party or the group, whichever party we're talking about, any party that calls themselves Leninist. Democratic centralism of the bottom does not hold water when compared to democratic centralism of the top. It was stressed there in the reading. Centralization, centralized, doesn't say decentralized. It doesn't say decentralization. It's centralization, which means the center. That's where the word comes from. And where the center is, that's where it comes from. It says it right there. I'm not saying it. It says it right there. Central committee or a Politburo is not the same as democratic centralism of a commission or a department or a cell. They're totally different. One takes precedence over the other. And I think that misunderstanding of what democratic centralism is derives from an anarchistic individualistic thinking that mm -hmm. says, where I am influential, that's what's important. There was one point where Lenin was facing criticism for suppressing a minority publication on an issue that had already been voted on. And he said something along the lines of, just as you have freedom of speech, we have freedom of association. You can speak your mind against the party line, and we can choose to not associate with you. On the topic of democratic centralism, I believe that this is talked about later on in this reading, but the two things have a dialectical relationship and they also have an evolving relationship based on circumstances. And so the form that democratic centralism takes when, for example, a party is illegal is different than what it takes when it is legal and the specific peculiarities there. However, in any dialectical relationship, there is always one thing that's primary and one thing that's secondary. For example, within society, the basis primary superstructure is secondary. With democratic centralism, centralism really is the primary in the relationship there because if you have a rank and file that is not quite up to par, that is a problem. If you have leadership that has the same problem, then that can be dead. Look at what happened with the CPUSA. They had struggles, sure, throughout their entire existence. But once that poison crept its way into leadership and really took hold there, that was the death of the CPUSA. That's something that is a, important to consider there. On the topic of work in the party, when people join the party and don't do the work, I always wonder, why did you join? Why would you join a communist party and then not do the work? Anyone who joins this party should understand that this is the most important thing you can do. There is no greater cause to be working for. I'm not even saying this in a disrespectful way, but if there's anybody on this call who feels like they fall into that, ask yourself, why are you here? You should be able to answer that question and it should motivate you to provide, to do that work. On democratic centralism, I've heard something to the effect that as a communist, you're not supposed to subordinate yourself. This is uncommunist. This is like fascist line of thinking. Comrade Stalin puts it pretty plainly in Foundations. He says that we aren't unconsciously subordinating. The exact opposite. It's much stronger when it is a conscious subordination of the minority to the majority. That's the heart of democratic centralism. The internal life of the party is organized in such a way as to allow the maximum participation of the communist practical work. This is the essence of party democracy. 
all necessary conditions are established for giving the party members the opportunity to discuss all questions, to check the fulfillment of adopted decisions, to elect the leaders, and to know and check their activities. The Communist Party does not reduce inner party democracy to mere participation in electing the leadership. Such a notion of democracy, which prevails in the Social Democratic Party, is essentially a transfer of the norms and rules of a bourgeois parliamentarism to party life. The democracy of a communist party is a democracy of vigorous common action, a democracy in which the members of the party not only elect and discuss, but also take a practical part in guiding the work of the party. The communist and workers' parties of different countries have developed and practiced numerous forms of drawing the party into active work. In the CPSU, about 20% of the communists work on party committees as branch secretaries and party group organizers. The rest of the members receive party assignments from their organization. The Communist Party of China practices a method of mass control in which a large number of communists take part. Various forms of enlisting broad circles of communists in elaborating and executing decisions, such as commissions, initiating committees, etc., are widespread in the French and Italian Communist Party. But the active participation of all communists in the activities of the party does not detract from the significance of leadership or the role of the leaders who possess the necessary abilities, knowledge, and experience. The history of the working class movement of different countries has shown that political parties can operate successfully if they have stable groups of experienced, authoritative, and influential leaders. Such people constitute the leading nucleus of a party. Its cadres, its elected leadership, which organizes in practice the execution of adopted decisions and ensures continuity of experience and tradition. The leading party personnel does not stand above the party, but is under party control. Comrade Lenin said that under democratic conditions, the political activities of the party workers were open to view like a theater stage to the spectator. Everyone knows that a certain political figure began in such and such a way, passed through such and such an evolution, behaved in a trying moment in such and such a way, and possesses such qualities, and consequently, all party members, knowing all the facts, can elect or refuse to elect this person to a particular party office. The natural selection by full publicity election and universal control provides the guarantee that in the last analysis every political figure will be in his proper place will do the work for which he is best fitted by his capacity and ability will feel the effects of his mistakes on himself and will prove before all the world his ability to recognize mistakes and to avoid them. thus party democracy is a highly important condition for the proper formation, selection, and education of the leading personnel. At the same time, democracy is a guarantee that the leadership will rely on collective experience rather than merely reflect the personal views of some particular party worker. This is a really great quote. I feel like in my own political experience and organizing experience, a lot of parties don't allow for members to have the opportunity to organize as well. Work isn't distributed. It makes a very clear distinction that work doesn't necessarily have to be distributed equally between all members of the party and that the democratic process within these parties needs to be followed by and people with that important leadership and experience. and political information should be given a higher position. Same with the anarchists. If we don't have democratic centralism and the minority can just block things, then we're just going to get nowhere. That goes completely against a vanguard party and democratic centralism.
One part that really stuck out to me in that reading was the portion where it says, a democracy in which the members of the party not only elect and discuss, but also take a practical part in guiding the work of the party. I think especially with it being the new year and we've been having reflections on 2021, I think as party members, we should be able to look back and see how not only ourselves, but how our comrades have done work in the party and how we've helped shape the parties and the commissions and things like that. So taking a practical part in guiding the work of the party, we should be able to look back every year and see the tangible things that we've done to advance the party and advance its positions and the commissions. We should always be proud of that. Centralized leadership is needed to bring unity to the United Party, and that is very important in the leadership being the most knowledgeable and being selected by the people. We pick our leaders, and we should pick the people we feel are the best to lead from among us, and then they can help give people in the best positions to bring the party forward and do the best good work. As we're growing up, none of us are thinking about, wouldn't it be great? We could be communists. We could be considered enemies of the state. And we don't really have the experience or know what we're doing. It's a learning curve. You're going to have to figure out how to make it work. We have a lot of work to do. A quote that I heard once was, a communist experiences himself as simply a tool whose function is to actualize a historical necessity. There are plenty of opportunities in this party for comrades, whether they're new or experienced, to step up and help contribute. That's something that's very big. If you're new to this movement or new to the party, you kind of feel like you want to do more, find something to step up to it. I've been in the party barely a year. As soon as I came in, they found work for me to do. And that's kept me busy and committed, and I've kept adding on to it, and I've enjoyed it. There's always stuff for everyone to do, and if you're willing to do it, find it. About the historical necessity and being a tool for it, I can't stress the importance of adopting that view enough. I am 100% confident in the victory of socialism over capitalism. That's not because I'm confident in my own abilities. It's not because I'm confident in the abilities of everybody else. Also, both of those things are true. It's because it is a historical necessity. It's the next stage of development. It will happen with or without my personal participation. I want to be a part of it, but it is not dependent on that. Keeping that in mind is very important to combat the egotism that is very easy to develop when you're participating in this sort of work because I fell into that myself where I got all up my own ass because I was like, oh yeah, I'm fighting for the next stage of society. Where the thing is, is we should be proud of that. We should be very proud of the role that we play. We shouldn't allow it to make us arrogant because it will happen without us. We should do all we can to be a part of it. When you do the work and the duties of being in a communist party, that's fulfilling work. And so that defeats the myth that some of the bourgeois or ultra left pass off as communist work being boring, constant committee work. No, when you come together with comrades and when you actually get things done and you're looking towards a goal that benefits everybody you know, that is something that is fulfilling. That is something that when you die, and if it's on your gravestone, you'll be proud that you spent your life doing that versus not doing anything and being part of the problem. For a communist party, the communist party does have a chair. and has a chair, they hold a lot of power and decision-making prowess. Can someone explain the benefits of having a singular leader instead of just keeping it as the council? itself or the top council. Here's the way it operates. It has always operated in our party. If people don't like the way it operates, then they can bring it up at a Congress. But this is the way we started in 2016. The Politburo acts as a whole. The person who speaks for the Politburo and is basically the official voice of the party in any party is the general secretary or the first secretary like in the Soviet Union was Lenin, the first secretary, Stalin. The Central Committee elects a PB. 
the PB has a discussion, and then the PB votes on it. Once the PB votes on it, some people in the PB may not like the vote. They may be in the minority. And then those people in the minority, if they accept the majority, then they're acting as Bolsheviks. If they fight against the majority, and they use all kinds of reasons why they're fighting against it, then in reality, they're fighting for the minority, and that's not what a Bolshevik party does. And this is not my opinion, by the way. This is the way it works. And our party, the general secretary has the authority to appoint people to different positions, whether they're commissions, the head of the newspaper, etc. If one doesn't like that, then one tries to bring that up at the Congress. One of the main reasons that we have a singular person who takes the role as the general secretary is because there needs to be someone who carries out the day-to-day -day work of the Politburo. Usually the way that we're organized, it's not like all of the members of a Communist Party's Politburo are always around each other at the same time. And this was especially true back before we had ready access to telephones. Everyone was writing letters to each other at the time. So the role of a general secretary is purely executive so that there is someone who is dedicated to carrying out the day-to-day -day work when the Politburo is not in session and the Politburo's role is to carry out the executive of the central committee and so on because these bodies get bigger and bigger as we go down the line. So that really is the role of the general secretary. In the section we just read, it talked about vigorous, common action. Obviously, those are three important words, vigorous, common, and action. But the word common in there implies that the democracy has to be done in a way that is collective. It basically exemplifies what a comrade said, that centralism is really the key theme that you're hitting on. The democratic is more in the subordinate position. Lenin said that politics were not only a science, but an art. This means that political leadership requires not only a correct, scientifically trustworthy analysis of the situation, and the drawing up on this basis of a correct line, but also great ability, skill, and real artistry in putting this line into effect. Without such skill, even the best political line will be of no avail. A correct decision as to the main aim and the chief enemy at a given stage will be useless if the party is unable to organize the struggle for this aim and against this enemy. It is possible correctly to determine the allies of the working class, but will it be of any use if the party is unable to win them over to its side? and to organize and lead their struggle. Thus, for political leadership, it is important not only to know, but also to be able to put this knowledge into practice. How then can the party acquire such ability, such skill? Theoretical studies alone are, of course, not enough. Each party can master the art of political leadership only from its own extensive experience. For a revolutionary party, there is no school that can replace the school of practical struggle with all of its trials and tribulations, victories and defeats, successes and failures. Of course, all this does not mean that each party must itself necessarily experience absolutely everything and can learn only through its setbacks. The process of learning the art of politics can be considerably accelerated, and the number of defeats mistakes, and failures greatly reduce if the experience of the other party, the experience of the international revolutionary movement, is carefully and skillfully studied and utilized. The works in which this experience has been generalized are an invaluable aid for those who would learn the art of political leadership. Especially important in this respect is Comrade Lenin's outstanding book, Left Wing Communism, an Infantile Disorder. Cannot stress that book enough. 
which has always been of enormous importance for the international communist movement. What basic spheres of activity does the art of political leadership include? It includes, above all, the ability to work among the masses. Only the parties and leaders whose lives are bound up with the interests of the working people who share in their aspirations and are selflessly devoted to them can successfully cope with this task. One of the Leninist principles of the art of politics is that propaganda and agitation alone are not enough to draw the masses into an active struggle. For this, their own political experience is essential. Comrade Lenin said that the millions of people will never heed the advice of parties if this advice does not coincide with what the experience of their own lives teaches them. Hence, the art of political leadership consists in using means and methods which, by being derived from the experience of the masses and the level of their class consciousness, can advance the masses in the struggle for the final aim. The party cannot wait passively until reality itself will have taught the masses. It must be able to help them to arrive at the proper conclusion. Comrade Lenin referred to this as the ability to bring the masses to the positions of a decisive struggle on the basis of their own experience. The masses perceive surrounding reality through the facts which they encounter every day and which directly affect them. Hence, the parties can bring the working people into the struggle against capitalism only by leading the struggle for the immediate economic needs and political <coughs> interests of the masses by putting forward demands in line with the urgent requirements of the different sections of the working people, and by fighting for the satisfaction of these demands. An important part of the art of political leadership is, furthermore, the ability of the leadership to unite its efforts with the efforts of all those with whom it is possible to achieve unity of action, including those with whom there are differences on fundamental questions. This is an important, also difficult matter, as will be shown in greater detail in the next chapter. The art of political leadership also includes the ability correctly to choose suitable forms of struggle for a given situation, and the ability to be ready to change these forms most swiftly and unexpectedly. If a party knows how to choose the forms of struggle correctly, and if it elaborates a political line in accord with the existing condition, it can act vigorously and achieve definite results under the most complicated and difficult conditions. A party of the Leninist type will never stand by idly, holding aloof and waiting for the great hour the situation which will itself evoke the revolutionary enthusiasm of the working people and weaken the resistance of their enemies. It seeks and finds possibilities for active work among the masses, for an active political struggle, even, even under the most unfavorable conditions. The party thus strengthens its position, and what is even more important, brings very much closer the hour of the decisive battle and prepares for this hour not only itself, but also the broadest possible sections of the working people. The supreme art of political leadership consists precisely in the ability to find, even during the periods when the revolution abates, directions and forms of struggle that will provide the basis for future victories and will bring these victories closer. A brilliant example of such art is the Leninist policy of the Russian communists during the years of reaction, which followed the defeat of the 1905 to 1907 revolution. During those years, the party showed how to act as if a revolution had failed. At that time, Comrade Lenin wrote, the revolutionary parties must complete their education. They have learned to attack. Now it is time to realize that this knowledge must be supplemented with the knowledge of how to retreat properly, to realize 
and the revolutionary class is taught to realize it by its own bitter experience, that victory is impossible unless they have learned both the right way to attack and the right way to retreat. Considering the perspective of the international communist movement, some people may try to think that we have to reinvent the wheel just because at least the Bolshevik movement in America were so small, which is not the case. We have plenty of fraternal parties. We had parties that sent greetings to our party, Communist Party of Venezuela, Communist Party of Mexico, Communist Party of Greece, the Zimbabwe Communist Party, New Communist Party of Britain. So if we're trying to analyze the situation and maybe we don't understand the situation as much, whatever the case may be, it's always helpful, maybe not to look at them in a sense that you accept everything, because there's no official international communist movement. There's International Communist Review, there's SolidNet, there's different attempts at it, but there's not anything like the common turn that exists right now. So making sure that we take into consideration the analysis of our fraternal parties, the same working class movements that are fighting for the same goals that we are, along the same ideological lines that we're fighting. It's really important that we take their analysis into account when we're doing our own work, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There was a section that said agitation alone won't bring the masses in line with the party, and that experience is a big driver. And I've been working with a tenants union in my city for quite some time now, and there's been a lot of tenants that they were kind of apathetic, but last time I met up with them while canvassing, a couple of them brought up the recent fires that took place in a couple apartment complexes in Bronx, New York, and Philadelphia, and they realized that the heating in their apartment was not sufficient, so most tenants have space heaters, and immediately recognize that this is a bigger issue, that their apartment could catch on fire at any moment. A line that really stuck out to me was, it said, there's no school can replace the school of practical struggle. That's extremely important to know. Remember, I really like to read theory. I'm trying to read more. But I think getting out and being amongst the people and trying to evoke change that way is really the best teacher for how things are going to go. Everyone who has met me in person knows I'm a communist. I'm pretty loud about it. <laughs> and I'm constantly trying to work them over and bring them to our side. And a lot of my coworkers start off as libertarian tech bros, but I've got them a lot more coming towards the anti-capitalist side at the minimum, if not really considering looking at communism. And even the biggest struggle I've had is apolitical people who just feel no one's going to help them in the system. And I try to reach them by agreeing that the system they, they've seen, no one is going to try to help them empower. But a new system where we wield the power as the people is what they need. And that really seems to resonate a lot more with people who have been working their whole lives and just feel like no one cares. And you have to explain that, yeah, the rich people don't care. It's going to only come when we take control and can implement that change. Vanguard, why we call ourselves a vanguard? To be in the forefront, not too far ahead. Not too far ahead. We lose the masses if we're too far ahead. What's the opposite of that? Tailing them by working behind the masses as they're marching on, we're behind them. Saying, yeah, we support you, we support you. And we're doing nothing to direct the anger of the masses. That's called tailism. The word voluntary, which means not forced. A Bolshevik party has to be a voluntary coming together. No one's putting a gun to anybody's head. And if you do not agree with the leadership of a Bolshevik party, not like a bourgeois reaction, one has to go where the majority go. If you cannot reconcile that with yourself, then you only have one way out, and that is to walk out the door you came in. It's really that simple. But don't try to capture and force the majority to what you are coming from, your viewpoint. Purge. Nobody has mentioned here yet what is the idea of a purge. Typical U.S. reaction to that word 
is that uh, purge is when people are taken out of the party, brought into the yard, and shot. That's the American reaction to the word purge. It has nothing to do with what Lenin was talking about. Lenin made it very clear. Just like in a body, one every so often has to purge that body of toxins, which can make the body work ineffectually. You have to purge yourself of these toxins. It's the right and duty of every party cell to have a yearly meeting where they reapply to the party and where those individuals can be rejected who are not doing properly what they're supposed to be doing, just like purging the body of toxins. What if a cell decides to take a certain road and the center has taken a competing road? Picture this. Who do comrades in each of the cells follow? Do they follow their local cell or do they follow the national center? What has to be asked is a cell cannot become a new center. It cannot compete with the national center that was elected by all the cells in the party once every couple of years. Stalin says it best when he says there cannot be two competing centers. There has to be only one. The difference between the ultra-left and the main road communist. Theory, correctness is not enough. Very important. So we have a correct theory, which is very important. However, if we have no connection with the masses, that theory is useless. We need to have both the correct theory and the connection with the masses. And that's not easy to do. That's not easy. If we don't concentrate on the economic interest of the masses, we're not going to connect with them. It's important to take their main issue, which is everyday economic struggles, and use that economic struggle in order to further their understanding of what anti-capitalism actions are. Talk about uniting. Yes, we call it coalitions. That's what we call it, coalition work. Uniting with all groups of people that normally we don't work with. We normally disagree with them on A, B, or C, political nine. The closer the hour for battle, does internal infighting in a Bolshevik movement of a constant nature under the guise, under the guise of we want to debate. We want to debate. So they have constant internal infighting. Does that bring us closer to the hour for battle against capital? Or does it take us further away? While the masses are dealing with it, we're off on the side, usually the ultra-left side, talking about this point or that point. Talk about leadership tonight in this country with individualism. You'd think that we value leadership more than we do, but perhaps it's because we work with capitalist bosses who are supposedly our leaders who don't really have any allegiance to us or our well-being or anything like that, not to mention CEOs and large industrial capitalists. Anywhere in life, really, I think the school and the party have demonstrated the importance of leadership. And that, again, involves a two-sided thing. It involves acknowledging people with experience, giving their word more sway than people who joined the movement yesterday. And then also the leadership standing up and being strong in the face of adversity and making sure that things are being steered along the right lines for the interests of the working class, which is obviously our primary goal. A lot of people bring that mentality that leaders are bad, but our leaders are supposed to have our interests and be working for us, basically. So you need to look at it like that. They're not working for themselves. They're working for the collective. That is the whole point of our type of leadership. One of the things I really liked about the reading is the stress about getting people to engage as being a structural part of Bolshevism and democratic centralism, because I think that we don't really have political engagement in our, in our system at all right now, and people have never experienced it, but they also need to be held to it for it to actually work. And that's a key part of making it collective and making it work for everybody is involving people.
a quote from Lenin from what is to be done. And he talks exactly about this, about the necessity of democratic centralism. He says that we are marching in a compact group along a precipitous and difficult path, firmly holding each other by the hand. We are surrounded on all sides by enemies, and we have to advance almost constantly under their fire. We have combined by a freely adopted decision for the purpose of fighting the enemy and of not retreating into the neighboring marsh, the inhabitants of which from the very outset have reproached us with having separated ourselves into an exclusive group and with having chosen the path of struggle instead of the path of conciliation. And now those among us begin to cry out, let's go into the marsh. And when we begin to shame them, they retort, what backward people you are. Are you not ashamed to deny us the liberty to invite you to take a better road? Oh, yes, gentlemen, you are free not only to invite us, but to go yourselves wherever you will, even into the marsh. In fact, we think that the marsh is your proper place, and we are prepared to render you every assistance to get there. Only let go of our hands, don't clutch at us, and don't besmirch the grand word freedom. For we are too free to go where we please. Free to fight not only against the marsh, but against those who are turning towards the marsh about the centralized and the unity of the masses and having to take charge of the masses and be focused on it. And it's not an easy task. From last week, to we talk about leadership. And this week, talk about the fundamentals. I have to say, in a personal, uh, what's going on with me is working to fight against the zoning change in my city. And there's just three of us in the community that is, is really going forward with it. Each three of us are from opposite spectrum of the political ideology, but it's just for one common cause. And every time I think about that and I focus on what we are fighting for and stay in the unity of that, and we get a lot done. That involves, and I'm not really an experience in this at all. So, I mean, just to get involved with the government function and the city hall, it's all new. And I'm learning all the terminology and I, force myself to get on the podium and speak to the planning zoning board. It's nerve-wracking, but it's just moving forward and thinking about the people that are Trump voters on one side and the other, and here I am, and, and staying where we're going at. And every time I read this, I think about this, and I really am very, very happy to be here to be part of this. I wanted to deal with two things that were brought up. One is the importance of communists and politics. And the second one, which was talked about, is mentioning that how the bourgeois and the leadership of capitalist countries fear the communists on a political realm rather than just as labor organizations or mass organizations. In the 1930s and 1940s, the membership of unions was over 40% in the United States. And they had something called, if a brother union struck, everybody else involved with the strike, other unions were all involved in making sure if a grocery chain went on strike, the truckers itself would not uh, truck anything to that grocery chain. The capitalist class they passed something in the Congress called the Taft-Hartley Law, which is still in effect, which banned secondary strikes and made those illegal. And talking about how they fear a communist as a political power, in New York City alone, and Angela would recognize this, when they had represented a proportional a government, you had two communists in the city councils. One was a black from Harlem, and the other was Italian from Brooklyn. Ben Davis and Caccioni was in Brooklyn. They then changed the whole electoral rules, made it exactly. impossible for communists to get elected on individual districts. And that was the last time an open communist got elected. Angela's point on theory without action being useless. The basis of that action, I think, has to be building genuine social bonds with other workers, with people in your community. And to speak to that point, we were forced back on campus. I'm a teacher. We were forced back on campus. I'm still kind of dreading it, still assuming at some point I'm going to get sick. But I have to say, once I resigned myself to that, it was fantastic to be able to talk to my colleagues again, my fellow teachers in the unions, graduate students, and the maintenance staff, people who had seen through Zoom screens or 
only knew in the abstract as members of my union, meeting them in person, getting to talk to them, talking about our complaints together. That, to me, was profoundly important. Everyone here knows I'm a communist, so it's a good and bad thing. People will come up to me and ask me questions, but at the same time, people will try to attack me because I'm in Texas. But it's very important that we get into our communities, our works, and talk to our co-workers, our colleagues, and be involved in the community. We can't just hide behind a computer screen. Major theme of today's class was about party unity. And lately, I've been seeing a lot of Especially online, a lot of people saying how Marxist Leninist parties need to be a little bit more lenient with ideas and being open to new ideas. And to me, that makes me think of impurities in the concrete foundations of a building. When you have impurities, it weakens the structure, which is bound to make it collapse. When Comrade Angelo had talked about the two competing bases of power, and then this last section where it talked about leading the masses, a lot of the time when I see factionalism come up, it's because people want to be the big guy. They want to lead. They want to be a leader. And the funny thing is, you want to be a leader, do your job. Do your job as a communist. Not every communist is going to be a leader in the party, but every communist should be a leader in their community. People want leadership, lead the masses. Point two is that we have to meet people where they are. We're not going to convince anybody by running around talking about apocalypse now or some crap like that. We're not going to bring people over to our side by getting too far ahead of them. We need to meet people where they are and lead them to where they need to be. Thank you for listening to this full-length class from the People's School for Marxist-Leninist Studies. Support us at NewOutlookPublishers.net, join us on Discord, follow us on Twitter, and visit PeopleSchool.org to sign up for free classes.